Today we will talk about the lessons and implications from the Russia-Ukraine naval war in the Black Sea on the future of naval warfare. Keep in mind the conflict is still ongoing, so further developments that will be of significance may still happen, and we don't know what these will be as of yet. And it is entirely possible that in the future, naval experts will look back at everything we have said and consider them all wrong. So with these caveats in mind, let's get started. A bit of background. Ever since the start of the conflict, the vast majority of the Ukrainian fleet has been either scuttled by themselves or were sunk. And the Russian Navy has been and remains in control of most of the Black Sea. But Ukraine has effectively denied the Russian fleet access to a significant part of the Black Sea, especially that near Odessa. Through the effective use of land-based anti-ship missiles, naval mines, and drones. Furthermore, Russian naval reinforcements to the Black Sea have been limited, due to Turkey's closure of the straits. That said, the Russians have been able to bring in a trickle of reinforcements using the internal waterways of inland Russia. However, only smaller Russian naval vessels can traverse the inland waterways, the rivers and the canals. Major warships were barred from entering the Black Sea, almost since the start of the conflict. The Russian Navy's main mission are strikes against inland Ukrainian targets, blockade the ports of Odessa, and threaten amphibious landings. So the first lesson I want to home in on is that land-based anti-ship missiles pose a real threat to large warships. And in the future, we may very well see land-based missile systems deter a superior fleet from entering within range of these coastal weapons. Using coastal anti-ship missiles to engage hostile warships is a long-held idea. It is one that was championed by the Soviet Navy in the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea during the Cold War, and more recently has been adopted by the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force to hold at bay the superior carrier-based navy of the United States and its Western allies. The Ukraine war showed the advantages of the strategy in an asymmetric setting. Land-based anti-ship missiles are affordable compared to the warships they target, for example, big cruisers and aircraft carriers. These missile systems are mobile because they can be mounted in a truck chassis. They are also easily concealed, for example, inside bunkers or natural vegetation. There were clear examples of both anti-ship cruise missiles and anti-ship ballistic missiles being used effectively, either to sink enemy warships or to deter them from coming too close to the coastline where they can bombard coastal targets using their shorter range weaponry, for example naval guns. So we all know what happened to the Russian cruiser Moskva. It was sunk in April 2022. Ukraine claimed to have hit the Moskva with two Neptune anti-ship cruise missiles. These are subsonic anti-ship missiles, itself a derivative of the Soviet-Russian KH-35 cruise missile. The Moskva sunk later after it was damaged while under tow on the way back to Crimea. According to the Russians, the sinking of the Moskva was caused by an ammunition explosion on board the ship during a storm. However, after the incident, Russian warships started to operate noticeably much further away from the Ukrainian coastline. The actual behavior of the Russians following the incident gives, in my view, some hints as to what actually happened. So, in my opinion, this lends credibility to the claim the Moskva was sunk by anti-ship missiles. U.S. intelligence admitted to providing info on the Moskva's location prior to her sinking. So, it is entirely possible that Ukraine used this intel to acquire the targeting info to sink the Moskva. Although a senior Ukrainian official tacitly noted that a TB-2 aerial drone was used to distract the air defenses of the Moskva, 
likely providing the targeting info for the land-based weapons. On paper, two Neptune missiles probably shouldn't have been enough to sink the Mosva, given that the warship has a triple-layered air defense system. It has long-range SAM missiles, short to medium-range air defense missiles, and several close-in weapon systems, the AK-630s. Now, Western commentators pointed to the alleged poor maintenance of the warship and inadequate training for the crew as reasons why the actual air defense capabilities of the Moskva fell short of her on-paper capabilities. I am not necessarily disputing that. But what I see is, in an actual naval battle, a lot can go wrong. And warships are becoming more vulnerable to anti-ship missiles than ever before. And it is certainly not just the Moskva that was sunk by anti-ship missiles. In June 2022, the Russian tugboat, the Vasily Bek, was sunk near Snake Island while resupplying the garrison. The vessel was sunk by two Harpoon anti-ship missiles supplied to Ukraine by the Western powers. Russia has since relinquished the island, because its naval presence on the island was clearly becoming untenable, incurring additional losses by the day. Snake Island is obviously very close to the Ukrainian port city of Odessa, and well within range of Ukraine's land-based cruise missiles. On the 24th of March 2022, Ukraine attacked with ballistic missiles the port city of Brdyansk, which has recently fallen to Russian forces. During the attack, two Russian LST landing ships were damaged, including the large landing ship, the Saratov, which later sank in port. The Saratov has since been salvaged, and is due to be towed back to Crimea. Now, I am aware that all evidence points to the Russian landing ships being static at the time they were hit by the ballistic missiles. Still, the attack illustrated that the guidance systems on the ballistic missiles has become sufficiently advanced to be able to target something relatively small as a warship, a fair distance away. The other point self-evident in the conflict so far is that aerial drones and unmanned surface vehicles, or USVs, are posing ever greater threats than before. They can attack a warship from multiple angles, including from the air and at water level, and through different modes of attack, ranging from rockets and smart bombs to kamikaze attacks. On the 30th October, the Russian fleet was attacked while in port at Sevastopol. The attack was conducted by kamikaze USVs and aerial drones. Russian forces managed to destroy some of these, but at least three USVs managed to close in on their targets. The basic idea of using kamikaze USVs as a self-guiding homing projectile is not new. But the strike on Sevastopol was the first time this abstract idea was actually put into practice. A Russian minesweeper was damaged during the attack, and according to open source investigation using video footages, the new flagship, the Admiral Makarov, the Admiral Gagurovich class frigate, was also damaged. In addition to the USVs, Ukraine has continually employed the Turkish TB2 Unmanned Combat Aerial Drones, or UCAVs. These UAVs carry missiles, rockets, and smart bombs in their hardpoints. Throughout the naval war, the TB2 drones have targeted Russian patrol boats and landing ships, and have destroyed several of these. Moreover, the drones have also played a surveillance role, searching and finding the targets for follow-up strikes by land-based cruise missiles. So the naval war in the Black Sea increasingly illustrated the growing importance of unmanned aerial and surface vehicles. The availability of surveillance drones and outer recon assets leads me to my next point, that large warships at sea are becoming increasingly easy to find, especially in close littoral waters. 
Even out in the middle of the ocean, highly dense networks of low-orbit surveillance satellites can provide constant monitoring and reconnaissance of the oceanic battlefield. For large aircraft carrier battle groups, or even surface action groups, there would be nowhere to hide. The two major naval powers in the world, the US and China, both have enough surveillance satellites to maintain high-resolution monitoring over a large patch of water 24-7. The Ukraine war also demonstrated that even parties that are neutral to the conflict may not maintain strict neutrality. Neutral powers have the means and sometimes the incentive to provide info on the location of the adversary's naval forces. We have seen this with the US providing info on the location of the Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, prior to its being struck by the two Neptune missiles. Ukraine may very well have used this info to send missiles to the Moskva. But there is very little the Russian Navy can do about this. If they shoot down American recon assets, it would almost certainly draw the US and NATO into the war. In a future naval conflict, we may very well see neutral powers deliberately surveying and monitoring the adversary's naval forces for the other belligerents. Without taking on board an excessive risk of broadening the war in a way that is not in your favour, a belligerent cannot simply decide to shoot down a neutral country's recon assets, even if it is actively spying for the other side. My overall point is that the oceanic battlefield is getting smaller, and it is becoming very easy to find large warships at sea. This is due to developments in recon assets, including low-orbit satellite networks, as well as surveillance by third-party neutral actors. Everything we've covered so far points to one thing that big and expensive complex warships are increasingly becoming very vulnerable. The development of the major navies over the past couple of decades, including for both the Chinese Navy and the US Navy, have been heading towards larger, fewer, and more expensive ships. These include aircraft carriers and large Aegis air warfare destroyers. Even the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force is considering building 20,000-ton anti-ballistic missile defense warships. The Russo-Ukraine naval war in the Black Sea demonstrated that these ships are potentially very cheap to counter. A modern air warfare ship can plausibly be sunk by anti-ship missiles a tiny fraction of the cost of the warship. I know that theoretically, the air defense warship should be able to defend itself against a couple of incoming missiles. But self-evidently, as the war has shown, in a real naval battle, a lot of things may easily not go according to plan, leading to a high risk of the ship going down. There is potentially a lot of different ways for the belligerents to locate each other's important capital ships including through satellite surveillance and the use of third-party intelligence provided by technically neutral countries. So large and expensive warships are becoming easy to find, and this is a significant first step towards acquiring a viable firing solution on the warship. As a result of the Russo-Ukrainian naval war, we may see navies shift gradually towards a larger number of smaller vessels with more dispersed firepower, as opposed to putting all their eggs in a small number of large and expensive baskets, as is the case currently. My final observation is that throughout the entire naval war, the Russian Navy has maintained a substantial fleet of landing ships in ports in Crimea. These continue to pose a theoretical amphibious threat to Ukrainian port cities like Odessa and Mykolaiv. The threat of Russian amphibious landings is probably more real early on in the conflict, when Russia had the reserves to actually make such a landing operation, in theory. At this point in the war, Russian reserves are largely already committed, and new troops being mobilized will take some time to train and prepare before they can become combat-ready. 
Nevertheless, the naval war in the Black Sea illustrated that an amphibious fleet in being is a viable concept in tying down the resources of the defending forces, forcing them to deploy troops in port cities to anticipate a possible amphibious landing. This means less Ukrainian troops that can be deployed elsewhere. I would actually go as far to say that the threat of an amphibious landing is actually more effective than an actual opposed landing. Because unless you have a huge superiority in shore bombardment capabilities, it is very very difficult to land light infantry and light amphibious armoured vehicles into the teeth of the heavy armour and heavy artillery of the defending forces. Therefore, an implied amphibious threat is in many ways more powerful psychologically in provoking a response from the opponent in trying to defend against all the possible avenues of attack. The war in Ukraine is continuing, with no clear end in sight. Over time, we may see more tactics and technology employed in the naval war in the Black Sea to inform future naval warfare. We may see navies shifting gradually from a small number of large and powerful surface combatants to a larger number of smaller warships with more dispersed firepower and ease of concealment. Thanks for watching. If you like my video, please press the like button and subscribe if you haven't done so already.